this church service. I'd like to welcome in everyone to the Fountain Inn Presbyterian online worship service. I'd also like to welcome our friends from Grace Covenant who are joining us here today for our online worship. Today's church service is a recording of our first time being back in our sanctuary at Fountain Inn Presbyterian Church since the early time in March before COVID-19 hit. So as a church, we're trying to deal with how to do these online worship services, and we're actually putting in some new technology, and we're going to go through a series of, uh, of substitute pastors here the next couple of weeks during the Advent season. And for our Fountain and Presbyterian church members, uh, we believe in another week or so we'll be able to show the actual church services live um, and stream them through the church YouTube page, and I'll also be able to produce those with all the words and the things that are needed to kind of conduct a nice church service from home. So if you'll please bear with us during the episode you're going to watch today and maybe the next week or two as we kind of get our footing and figure out how to do these online worship services live. We are really excited to be back in the sanctuary. We hope that when you feel safe enough to join us and, and follow along with our COVID-19 protocols, you will come join us here at church and to our members at Grace Covenant. We appreciate you folks for tuning in today. Good morning and welcome back. It's good to be back in the sanctuary and seeing all of our friends today. Um, we do have an announcement to make for dismissal purposes at the end of the service. If those on the piano side will exit out that exit, the side wall, and exit out the side door there, this side will take this aisle and exit out the front side. Um, so if you look behind you,
hear something in today's message that we can then take back to do your will, influence others, and help in the building back of this church as we come back into this sanctuary and get back to a new sense of normal in our church life here at Fountain and Presbyterian Church. In your name we pray. Amen. I, I can have the children come down for a time for children. puts a lot of pressure on you to be the only one to give answers here today, okay? What do you think the great commandment is for church service? It's definitely got to be no, you can't play with mom's phone during church service. What other kind of great commandments do we know that we have during church? Um, obey, God. obey God. That's always a pretty good one. That is always a pretty good one. The one we're going to talk about in church service today is love the God Love your God with all your heart and all your might and all your soul. Now, what do you think that means? How do you love God with all your might and all your heart and all your soul? I think it's strength at the end. but Pray and worship him. Okay. What kind of things do we do here at church then that show how much we love God with all our heart and all our soul? Do music? Do you think music is a way of showing God how much we love Him? You do? I think so too, definitely. What about outside of the church service? Like what? How do you help others? What's some of the activities y'all have done? Mission trips. What about the thing y'all did outside? What did y'all do out there oh, during COVID? What did y'all y'all met and asked people from the church to do what? Donate school supplies. Now, why did y'all donate school supplies? Okay, so not enough money for school supplies for teachers, and y'all thought that'd be, is that doing God's work? Because I don't remember reading the Bible and seeing anything about school supplies. You still think so? Why? Very good. I think that's a good answer. You're doing God's work by giving to others and by helping in the time of need. Maybe trying to fill a little bit of a void for somebody. In this case, the teachers need a little bit extra supplies. Maybe there's some students out there who, because of mom and dad losing jobs, they weren't able to, to get the school supplies. So I thought that was a great thing we did as a church. So it's pretty simple. Here at church, every week we are going to try to love our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our might. And that's what we do in our little mission trips with our children. Can you guys, can you please pray with me? Dear God, thank you. For the opportunities to do your work each week at church. Amen. Our scripture reading today is an Old Testament reading. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you, observing the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children, after them, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, your God of ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, and the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and 
open your gates. This is the word of God. Be to God. So we have a pastor to take care of church service. Um, from now until January, everything's good to go. This is not going to be the new normal with me standing up here. Uh, however, for a long time, I, a man of great confidence, have sat back there and said, I mean, I got at least one sermon in me. I got one that I could do. And then a few weeks ago, you know, Kate Tumlin said something to the effect of, well, you're about to get your shot, big boy. <laughs> so I'm going to deliver today's message, um, not obviously as a pastor, not as anyone trained in anything other than just talking. And so if you've been to our Sunday schools, I'm going to try to just give a very simple and basic message that fits along with Deuteronomy. Try to tell a story or two, and I hope that you folks will get what you need out of this story here today. So basically, it's Linda Marie Garrett's fault. Okay? Linda Marie Garrett, the greatest of the Garrett children in my eyes, was a friend of mine. We grew up together in this church. We were the same age, and like the church is today, we were always outnumbered like 10 girls to every one boy. It's just the way of this church, except for that weird year of Jessica and Grant and Lucas and all that where it flipped. There's always been a lot of girls in this church, and we were going to have a lock-in. I'm not sure if y'all know that lock-ins are really important to middle school kids. It's a social activity. Once upon a time, we didn't have cell phones. Once upon a time, we didn't have my face. We didn't have these ways to get in touch with one another. And so a lock-in was a huge deal. When I was a kid, I went to the lock-in at, at the First Baptist Church. I would go to the lock-in at the Methodist Church. We would have a lock-in. We all just passed around because it was social time for middle schoolers. Play basketball, kick the can. You would run outside. We would just be outside running around this church had great leaders who would help us out. It was a fun time. And then Linda Marie Garrett ruined it all because she had a friend that liked me. And so her friend wanted to come to church to our lock-in because she liked me. Now, I'm sure many of you are saying, well, of course, look at what he turned into. Imagine me as a spelt seventh grade boy Beautiful flowing locks of hair. Who wouldn't have wanted to come and profess that, hey, you're going to be my boyfriend? Now, I had planned an entire night of playing basketball. We didn't have the CFC. We had an outdoor go goal that we would play basketball on. And my entire night was derailed by this girl who somehow became my new girlfriend. And Stephanie Fleming, our youth director at midnight, is taking a picture of me holding this girl's hand, interlocked fingers sitting in the room watching a movie at midnight. I had a girlfriend for the first time. Didn't get to play basketball, didn't get to play kick the can. I didn't realize at that time it would be a precursor to how marriage would eventually turn out for me later. We go to school on Monday. I didn't have any classes with this girl, so I just went about my business like normal. Around Thursday, I heard, hey, you haven't talked to your girlfriend all week at school. And I thought, well, I haven't seen her. What am I supposed to do? Somebody said, you should call her. Okay. I'll call her. I called her on Friday. We were going to have a football game that night at Hillcrest. I talked to her for about a minute and a half, and I said, are you coming to the football game tonight? She said, yes. I said, great. Hung up the phone as fast as possible. We went to the football game that night. I looked around for her because, again, girlfriend, I guess I'm supposed to go stand wherever she is. One of her friends comes up to me and says, she wants to break up with you. <laughs> I look, and I see the girl standing behind the stands, peeking around the corner to see if the job had been done. I was now a dumped seventh grade boy. The whirlwind of this love in one whole week is what I'm going to use to kind of compare our experience in this church for about the last two years. It's been really frustrating. It has been really difficult. Hey, we're getting our group together. We're going to do these committees, and we're going to find a pastor. We all come to church. We do the committees. Hey, have you heard so-and-so's leaving? They're going to another church. 
don't worry, we're still good. We do the surveys, we post stuff. Hey, our thing, a myth, has been posted. That's a really big deal, we're getting close to a pastor. That was in 2018. We then continue. Hey, we're still doing good. Everybody doing good? Are you doing good? We need to do some activities. Doesn't seem like we have as many children anymore. Hey, did you hear that so-and-so, they also left and are going somewhere else? We're still good. Don't worry, everybody. That was 2019. And then this year, the obstacle that all churches have had to face. We're trying to stay good, and now we can't be together anymore. And it's been really, really difficult. I applaud all of our efforts with the online worship, but it's just not the same. My wife said she gave a term that I think has been really good. She feels as if she's been spiritually homeless for many months. She just lost the connection with the online service. Yes, she watched, but it wasn't the same. And we tried to come do activities but kids want to play and kids want to be around each other. And there's only so many times we can say, guys, you got to spread back out. It's been a really tough year for our church. And much like my seventh grade relationship, it's kind of followed the same cycle of a little bit of losing interest. And I know that Ludd has preached on that topic as a big topic that all churches across the country are going to have to deal with now. The loss of interest in the church. Now, I don't think that churches are going away. I think that churches are just going to have to do a really good job of reaching back out and making those connections with their congregations. It was great for a couple weeks to watch church service in my pajamas. I really enjoyed it. But I don't want that to become the norm. I think that we as a church group are going to have to commit to re-energizing our church group. Now, I gave you all the names. It started with a girlfriend breaking my heart in seventh grade. Not really breaking my heart, but breaking up with me. And I compare it to the church. Now, in another lifetime, I was a really good coach. And coaches get to give good speeches. So I am here today in my lesson. This is our pep talk. This is what I want to do today. I want to talk to you like we used to talk to our athletes. And I hope that we can begin to use today as a re-energizing re of our congregation. It'll be a slow burn. I do not believe that what I say today will motivate 80 people to come next week. But it might motivate you to begin the process to getting back those 80 people. I'm going to knock over this mic at some point during this. When I was a coach, I talked to our athletes all the time about not having regrets at the end of the year. When we competed for a state championship, you wanted to know that you did everything in your power to be successful. The work was put in in November, December, and January so that if you lost in February, you could hold your head high and know that I did all I could. And sometimes the other kid tries really hard to beat you. So at Hillcrest Wrestling, we talk about three things. We talked about your participation, we talked about your effort, and we talked about your attitude. Those were the three things that you had 100% control over, and if you did those things right, you could hold your head high at the end of the year and know that you had done everything in your power to be successful. And if you look at the months that we're getting ready to do now, November, December, into January, Cindy Clemmer filmed a video from the PNC just a few weeks ago, and she said, we're moving along in the process. I'm sure we all hear rumors of what that means. I'm just going to tell you, I think it means we're probably going to have a pastor somewhere in the springtime. Could be really early, could be really late. And I don't want us as a congregation to sit around and wait for the pastor to re-energize our congregation. Our time is now to begin that process. We control our participation. I get it. It's really hard to go out to a group, whether it's women of the church or whether it's your Sunday school class, when it used to be 12 people and now it's four. It feels like a failure. But we need you to participate. 
Church should not be a burden. But there is a certain expectation that in our community, we need you here. It might be that someone was in church in worship service, excuse me, in Sunday school, and they tell a story of something that you relate to tremendously. And in that moment, the Lord is dinging in your head to say something. Well, you can't say something if you're not here. Now, Sunday school is not for everybody. Charlie Bell is amazing at sneaking out. He got stuck in Sunday school about three weeks ago because we did the old switcheroo. We did church service first and then Sunday school, and Charlie Bell got stuck. And he stayed for a church for a Sunday school class. That's great. Sunday school is not for Charlie Bell, but he does men of the church breakfasts all the time, and I don't go to any of those. So our church is going to provide you with many different ways in which you can involve. Please don't feel as if you are obligated to attend them all. But what you can attend, participate in. Your effort, your effort in our church is really important. You have all been in that moment where you just go through the motions. I have gone through the motions in church the last few months with online worship. Girls, get out of bed. We're watching church. Not because I was going to make them have any kind of meaningful impact, but just because I was saying it's Sunday. We should do this. I need to be better about controlling my effort in church. Am I engaged? Am I excited? You've all seen the magic that Shannon Lionel does. For two hours every Sunday night, she gets children to be engaged in one another. They put their cell phones down, and they talk, and they engage, and they have stories, and they have inside jokes. And we need to take a lesson from them. Our effort is our engagement in this church service and in church each and every week. And then finally, our attitude. This is the one that is the hardest for me. I am a scorekeeper Christian. I've talked about this in Sunday school for years. I am a scorekeeper Christian. I shouldn't be, and I try to fight it, but I'm one of those people that when people leave our church, it hurts me. It bothers me. When new people walk in the door, I go, hey, there's some new people. We're winning. And that's not, obviously, what our Christian faith should be. Our Christian faith is for us as a church here at Fountain Presbyterian to provide a community of worship. That's it. If it's 40 or if it's 140, our mission is the same. My attitude about church should not be impacted on the number of bodies that are here. It is my relationship with God and then any other kind of positive influence that I can have over anyone else that chooses to worship here with us. It should be as simple as that. And I have to fight those urges inside of me. And I know that some of you feel those same things. When people leave our church, it's not a personal slight against the way we do business. And when people choose our church, it's not a win for us. It's just simply my relationship controlling my attitude, and then how I can affect others. I struggle with that. Our church is going to thrive. We're going to have luncheons again. Not yet, because CDC really doesn't like it, but we're getting close. We're going to have church service where you don't have to wear your mask. Not yet, but we're getting close. We're going to have new members. We're going to play softball next summer. We're going to have bigger Sunday school classes. We're going to have more Sunday school classes. We're going to have our Bible studies. We're going to get opportunities to provide for our community, like our great mission project that we have now that you're not allowed to be a part of. When we agreed to do it, we didn't think that was going to be the case. But COVID-2020. You're going to get to serve meals to people in this community who really need it, and in their eyes, they thank you. And that's what we want to do as a church group. There will be babies, once again, in the nursery. You're going to get to hold babies. We're going to have new families. We're going to have young families. Our church congregation is not going to wither away and die. We're going through a really tough time, but we will survive and we 
So I was at the Citadel. And I went to a Bible study. I know, Citadel Bible study. Look, we weren't allowed to leave campus that much. There's a lot going on inside there. And sometimes there's some good things. I went to a Bible study. And I met a, man, I met a young man named Joe. Joe was from California. We were occasional kind of friends here and there. Then my junior year, I got moved companies, and I needed a roommate. So I went and became roommates with Joe. So I hung out with Joe. Joe introduced me to a girl. That girl and I met and eventually decided to go on a date. Me, not learning much from my past, decided what's a great place to go for your first date? A Hillcrest football game. So I took this girl to a Hillcrest football game on our first date, and I said, Mom, I'd like for you to meet Amanda. My faith provided me with an opportunity, and God delivered. I've had a really good life in this church, and I'm really proud of the time the opportunities and the engagements that I've had in this church. I appreciate the relationships that I have in this church, and I'm really, really, really excited. What I encourage you folks to do as our leaving message here today is simply, let's not wait on the new pastor. Whatever you need to do, find your motivation, find your engagement, improve your participation, improve your effort, improve your attitude, and when that state championship moment comes for us, when the new pastor walks in the door, we have no regrets about how it turns out on that day of competition for us. It's not really a competition, but it's the best I can do as a coach. If you will now, please join me in the Apostles' Creed, which you can find in your bulletin. And let's do our affirmation of faith. You can obviously say this with me as well. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you will, please you will go to me in prayer. Dear Lord, we are a very frustrated community. We are frustrated how the last couple of years have gone in our church as we've searched for a pastor, frustrated by what's going on with the elections around our country, we're frustrated with COVID-19, we're frustrated with the restrictions, we're frustrated with the mask, we're just genuinely a frustrated society right now. In these times, we come to you, Lord. We need your help. We listen closely to the messages that you give us. We read our Bibles. We try to find your guidance to get through and turn this frustration into something that is special. Something that we can be proud of. Something that enables us to do your will. Please hear us, Lord. Please give us the strength that we're going to need to do your will each and every day. We come to you, Lord, and we pray in the way that you have always taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.